Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Today, we are going to be talking about Susan Laurie Parks' play, Top Dog, Underdog. Uh, I really like this play. I think it's a great play to end the semester on, and I'll get to why in just a little bit. Um, but first, let's just talk a little bit about the playwright herself, uh, Susan Laurie Parks, pictured here. Uh, she was born 1963 on May 10th in Fort Knox, uh, Kentucky, military family. Uh, she went to high school in, uh, in Germany in middle school. Uh, she graduated from Mount Holyoke College um, and studied under uh, the famed black intellectual James Baldwin. Uh, this particular play, and she's still around, uh, this particular play won the Pulitzer uh, Prize for Drama in 2002. Now, one of the components of this play, right, are the, is a uh, street hustle uh, known as the Three Card Monty. Right. And because the play kind of really revolves around two people's relationship to that game and through that game to ideas of inheritance and work um, and status, um, I have learned in some of my other classes that um, uh, some students are not aware of what Three Card Monty is, honestly. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a demonstration in just one moment. So essentially, hi there. Uh, so essentially, the three card Monty, it is um, a magic trick. And of course, uh, if you bet on a magic trick, it becomes a hustle. Um, the idea is that there's three cards, and that's the three card Monty. You do, you can do things like a two card and a five card Monty. Um, but the three card Monty involves obviously three cards, right? You have two that are not very important, and one that is important, right? And so in this case, where we move the cards around, right? The hustle is to move the cards around, face down, obviously, and have the person try to guess where the queen ends up, right? And so by moving the cards around, right? You know, because the faster and faster you go, the harder it is, right? To pick up on where the queen is, right? So, where the hustle comes in, right, is if you keep getting people used to following where the queen is, right, follow the queen, follow the queen, follow the queen, follow the queen, trying to go faster and faster, follow the queen, yeah, <laughs> whoop, there, follow the queen, follow it, follow the queen, right, and the idea is where is the queen, where is the queen? Now, most people would choose the middle one, but that's of course not it. And if you have money riding on it, that's a big problem, right? So the hustle comes in, right? Where you're trying to go back and forth. And I'll show you this one more time, right? So follow the queen in the middle. Follow the queen, follow the queen, follow the queen. Right? Again, the queen is over here, not where you thought it would be. Now, because you know this is a hustle, you might uh, you know, know that that was coming. Um, but uh, what what happens really? It's a sleight of hand where like the big move covers the small move, right? So when I do this over and over again, you get used to seeing me drop the queen first, right? But at the very end, I don't. I drop that one instead of the queen the very last time, and so I hold the queen off in my hand. And so even when you think it's over here, it's actually over here, right? So that is the three card uh, Monty. So hello again, thank you for indulging my demonstration on the three card Monty because knowing how it kind of works uh, is I think adds to the enjoyment of this play. Um, let's get back to talking about the play itself. Now, this is a, a quote that um, uh, Miss Lori Parks uh, said in an interview about this play. And I think it's a good segue into what I wanna talk about this play for. Uh, she says, to me, Lincoln is the closest thing we have to a mythic figure. In the days of great Greek drama, they had Apollo and Medea and Oedipus, these larger than life figures that walked the earth and spoke, and they turned them into plays. Shakespeare had kings and queens that he fashioned into his stories. Lincoln, to me, is one of those, right? There's Miss Parks. So, yeah, we don't have kind of um, kind of mythic figures 
uh, um, really American mythic figures, except, right, Lincoln does tower uh, pretty tall as an almost totemic figure um, in the American mythos, what it means to be an American. Um, and, you know, we have ascribed to uh, Abraham Lincoln all sorts of um, uh, 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 qualities about himself that kind of raise him kind of above uh, uh, you know, common people, as it were. Uh, we seem to think that he had a kind of um, remarkable sense of justice and patience uh, and goodness, right, in him, um, which, you know, if you knew him in life, maybe he wouldn't have necessarily deserved, but, you know, he does deserve to be, you know, the greatest president, I think. Um, but yeah, but he is that kind of figure that is held up as uh, uh, almost mythic in American culture. And I like that um, uh, the playwright connects Lincoln to classical tragedy, right? Uh, she connects this play very specifically to classical tragedy. And I think that is a very good uh, opening to talk about this play through the lens of classical tragedy, right? Because it adheres remarkably well um, in a way that uh, is that could not be a coincidence or certainly not unnoticed uh, by the playwright. And that's why I like to kind of circle back to uh, talking a little bit about the poetics at the end. Now, just a kind of disclaimer. Um, when uh, talking about this play, um, just uh, honestly, I like talking about Fefu and her friends. Um, a lot of Fefu is about um, women uh, and a lot about this play are the two brothers, Lincoln and Booth, being Black. Um, I am neither a woman nor am I Black. Uh, and so the any kind of discussion about this play will necessarily be filtered through my own uh, non-Black perspective. And that has uh, its limitations, certainly, and I'm going to acknowledge those limitations at this point. Um, because the play does have a lot to say about um, uh, being Black, I think. But looking back, uh, talking about Aristotle, right, and even like the neoclassicists, we go back and the, the, the main thing that people think of are the, the unities, right, these classical unities. Um, now, Aristotle didn't, again, lay, lay them out in these bullet points. They were just kind of found through and implied by what he wrote. Um, but it's kind of been passed down through theater history, right? That there's a unity of time, a unity of action, a unity of place, right? That a unity of time means that a play should not cover a very long, or a tragedy should not cover a very long expanse of time, right? A unity of action means that uh, there should be kind of one plot going on, not a whole bunch of different plots. And the unity of place means that it takes place roughly in one location. Now, Aristotle thought that um, adhering to these was um, a pretty good way of keeping the play focused on kind of one complete action, right? Because, you know, the longer period of time that you cover in a play, the more likely it is that you're not telling kind of one story and that you're telling kind of multiple small stories. The same thing with um, kind of the unity of action, right? Uh, it could be represented by the number of people uh, whom the play concerns directly, right? You couldn't necessarily tell one story with a hundred individuals talking to each other, right? And so in order to tell one story, it limiting the number of relationships and the number of people on stage is a useful way to do that. And of course, if you're keeping um, the unity of time and the unity of action, if you're having few people and telling a uh, a small or a limited plot in a limited amount of time, they're probably not going to be going all over the place. Um, and so there is an implied unity of place as well um, that, again, uh, kind of French neoclassicists took to an extreme. Um, but they are still all there in service of telling one complete action. Now, this play takes place over one week, right? Um, and interestingly, scenes, because she breaks them down in scenes, right? Scenes one through four take place in over a period of less than 48 hours, right? So you have Thursday evening, Friday evening, later Friday evening, 
and then the next morning before dawn, right? All this play takes place at night, interestingly enough. Um, and then you have an intermission, right? And then the next time, several days have passed, a few days, so now it's that Wednesday night and then Thursday night again. So you kind of come full circle from a Thursday evening uh, back to the next Thursday night, which I would argue does uh, uh, contain a limiting uh, uh, period of time, right? Uh, it, it is not the kind of uh, one revolution of the sun that Aristotle talked about, you know, one day, um, but it still, does still limit time um, in a, a substantial capacity, keeping it to one week. Now, the characters in this play, there's only two of them, right? The only people on stage are the brothers, Lincoln and Booth. You know, they talk about other people. Um, there are various women, um, uh, you know, Grace and their, uh, their, their parents and um, Lincoln's boss and everything. But none of them ever actually appear on stage. It is just those two. And, you know, the, the minimum number of people that are required for dialogue and realistic dialogue on stage. Uh, what locations? It's just an apartment. It is, a, it is an apartment that they share, right? absolutely limiting the place. And so the uh, action that they're telling, the story of these two uh, brothers where um, Booth is trying to get back into hustling and trying to ask Lincoln for his help, Lincoln doesn't want to do it, and then it gives in and that kind of turns the plot into kind of almost an inevitable, an inevitable downfall, right, um, until the end. Uh, now, is this a classical tragedy? I would say, yes, it has much more in common with a classical tragedy than it doesn't, right? We already talked about the unity of place, time. I give it a kind of a check question mark. An action has few characters. There's nothing supernatural that happens, right? This is a play that is firmly, firmly grounded in realism, right? And even though Aristotle uh, was talking about uh, 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 wanting things that were either uh, in the action that were probable, or sorry, yeah, that were probable or necessary, right? Um, and he's talking about the action, not of the plot. Um, and so in uh, Arist you know, in classical tragedies, you know, Aristotle thought that having kind of an oracle saying, oh, this will happen would be okay. But if you look at this particular play, there is really nothing in the play that is unrealistic, that we could not imagine actually happening, right? The only thing, in the play, really, that seems to be a little bit um, outside of the realm of the normal world is Lincoln's job, because we kind of think that, that seems to me maybe a little bit metaphorical and a little bit of like, I don't think that's a real thing that people do. Um, uh, but that's really about it. But we never see him doing that actually on stage. On stage, just everything is just normal. There is, you know, at the height of the play, there is a recognition and reversal right? Um, the recognition that um, uh, Booth still has the money and that he killed uh, Grace, right? And that he had been lying the whole time about those things, right? The reversal, obviously, of who has the high status at the very end and Lincoln winning his brother's inheritance and about to cut the knot, right? And the reversal inevitably goes to the downfall, the tragedy of uh, Booth killing his brother, right? And so there is that recognition and reversal. Um, there is even, I didn't put this, there is a scene of suffering as well, which you don't really see in a lot of um, uh, contemporary plays, kind of a specific at, you know, in the very end of the play, the main character suffering, right? Because oftentimes that's cut out because we think that the main thing is like the bad thing that happens and then we don't see them. But Booth at the very end, his very last line is a cry of despair, holding his dying dead brother and recognizing what he did. And that is absolutely a scene of suffering. Now, Aristotle, and these uh, things in quotations are uh, Aristotle, by the way, um, pity is aroused by unmerited misfortune. Did Lincoln deserve to die? I don't think so. You know, it seems to be unmerited. Fear by the misfortune of a man like ourselves. Now, Lincoln and Booth, it, it is kind of a, a double tragedy. They both are tragic figures in their own ways. Um, but are they people like ourselves? I think 
that the grounded nature of this play, the realism that it has, um, certainly seeks to evoke that kind of feeling of familiarity and groundedness, like we can see ourselves in the characters and what they do and what their motivations are um, and what they feel like. So I would argue absolutely. The misfortune of the people, they are like us. And they're talking about, uh, uh, in terms of the people who were tragic figures, Aristotle thought that that person should be a man who is not eminently good and just, right? Neither Lincoln nor Booth are perfect. Certainly not. Neither of them are perfect at all. But whose misfortune is brought not about by vice or depravity, but by some error or frailty, right? They both have a weakness in them, right? Booth um, might have this weakness of uh, wanting to have some kind of inheritance left from his family, maybe. And he's a little bit of a hothead and loses his cool a little bit too much, well, a lot too much, and takes offense at being told and being treated like a little brother, right? He, uh, it is a deep wound of his to be treated like the, you know, the underdog, right? And of course, Lincoln, he has his um, vices too, right? For a long time in the play when he's doing that work, after he goes back, you know, at the beginning of the play, he hasn't, you know, touched cards and done uh, hustling for a long time. But there is still that part in him that does like to be, um, uh, who does like to uh, 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 be smarter than others in what he does and to win over uh, and to almost conquer other people, right? In taking their money and spending it and that kind of thing. And that kind of vice of his or that, that, that it is hidden, but it is some error that he can't keep it hidden, right? And then after he loses his job to a wax doll, right? He, uh, uh, that comes back out. And that part of Lincoln's um, uh, identity also ends up leading to his own downfall. Now, one thing, one, one way that this play is absolutely not, um, you know, Aristotle's uh, uh, perfect tragedy would be um, the status of the characters, right? Uh, Aristotle thought that he, again, you know, pardon these pronouns, but he, the tragic figure, must be one who is highly renowned and prosperous. Neither of these two are very highly renowned and prosperous. Um, they, they have, you know, Booth doesn't even want to hold down a job. He, he is a thief. Right, he um, you know, uh, is trying to acquire more money and get more skills. Right, he's not highly renowned or prosperous. Um, Lincoln isn't either. He doesn't get paid much for the job he has. He has having to live in his brother's apartment. So these people are not, you know, the kings and queens and war heroes of you know uh, antiquity, um, the plays of antiquity. And so that would be a difference too. Um, but Aristotle also, in terms of the diction of the play, um, he said that it's good to take regular speech and heighten it with rare or unusual words and metaphors. Now, uh, this play's diction is um, very, very interesting to me. Um, you know, it is written to, um, to evoke or approximate um, the way that, you know, to African-American brothers would speak to each other, right? Um, and even the, the, the words on the page, there are, uh, you know, apostrophes missing from contractions. There's uh, vowels missing. Even saying the word missing implies that it's an error or they're not, they're non-standard in the way that some of the vowels aren't there. Some of the word usage and uh, subject verb agreement are uh, non-standard as well. And so it is regular speech. We can understand completely what these people talk about, um, but heightened with rare and unusual words and metaphors. I want to um, look at uh, this uh, quote um, that Lincoln says in the play uh, as kind of a, um, a way to look at the diction. And Pardon me, but there's no one else here to say this. But it says, people are funny about the Lincoln shit. It's historical. People like the historical shit in a certain way. They like it to unfold the way they folded it up neatly like a book, not raggedy and bloody and screaming. You trying to get me fired. I'm a brother playing Lincoln. It's a stretch for anyone's imagination and it ain't easy for me neither. Every day I put on that shit. I leave my own shit at the door and I put on that shit and I go out there and I make it work. 
I make it look easy, but it's hard. That shit is hard, but it works because I work it. Right? Now, in this um, uh, uh, just small little speech, right? There is, um, you know, a repetition. There's assonance. Um, there is, you know, it's it's incredibly intelligible. But there are uh, metaphors, right? Um, they like to they're historical stiff shit. Um, they like to unfold it, you know, to, to experience it the way that they had it remembered, you know, neatly, not raggedy and bloody and screaming. Um, and I, I think that, you know, looking throughout the whole uh, play, there's a whole bunch of examples of this. Uh, now, switching gears just a little bit, I wanted to um, uh, talk about the fact that uh, the thought of this play, right? Um, you know, we talk about plot and character, or sorry, Aristotle talks about plot and character being important, and then thought, kind of the the, the um, societal or almost political things uh, or um, issues that the play discusses. Um, this play has a lot to say about work and a lot to say about property, right? And so this is Lincoln uh, saying um, that he thinks it is a virtue for himself to do something that is hard and make it look hard. Um, and it's a stretch. It's not easy for him, but he does it, right? I make it work. And it works because I work it, right? And so he values this, this job that his brother keeps on wanting to walk away from. Now, when he's talking about his parents, right, when they're talking about their parents, um, and he says, like, each of them had a special something that they were struggling against. Mom had hers, Pops had his, and they were struggling. We moved out of that um, uh, nasty apartment into a house, a whole house. It weren't perfect, but it was a house. And they bought it and they bought brought us there and everything we owned, figuring we could be a family in that house. And then things, those two separate things, each of them was struggling against, it would just leave them be. Them things would see the house and be impressed and just leave them be. Right? So talking about um, the relationship between um, the problems that you have and the life that you try to live, right? And thinking that you can pretend your way out and that um, with enough um, acquisition, right? Through work and through money with enough acquisition, um, your life will not have the same problems, even ones that don't have anything to do with money necessarily, right? Now, I like this compared to the previous quote, I like this one that uh, Booth says, right? Uh, talking about his parents, but then leading to him. It ain't like they both one day both together packed up all this shit and left us so they could have fun in the sun or some tropical island and you and me would have to grub it in the dirt forever. They didn't leave together. That makes it different. She left, two years go by, then he left. Like neither of them couldn't handle it no more. She split and he split. Like the whole family mortgage bills going to work thing was just too much. And I don't blame them. You don't see me holding down a steady job because it's bullshit and I know it. I see now cracked them up and I ain't going there, right? Okay, so Lincoln, or so Booth uh, consciously is trying to uh, be the inheritor of, his, of who his parents really ended up being. He wants to be the inheritor of the parents who left him, weirdly enough, right? Because he is philosophically agreeing that all these things that they built their life around don't matter because they crack. And they crack the, these things that um, they acquire in these jobs that they're holding broke his parents, right? And then broke up the family too, right? Um, so in the end, the reason that I like to um, uh, end with this play is because we started off talking about Aristotle and we started off talking about the poetics. Um, and throughout all of theater history, Right, there have been uh, rebuttals, uh, you know, people supporting, making apologies for Aristotle, um, others ignoring, and different kind of critiques. You know, oh well, you know, we shouldn't tell stories and take the audience on a journey and have them feel stuff. We want them to do stuff, or like, why are we? You know, that would be more Brecht or even Artaud. Like, why are we? Um, why are we doing stories at all? Because human beings are animals and we uh, experience life through sensation. So all of these things, um, top dog, underdog, winning the Pulitzer is a very good example of uh, you know, 21st uh, century theater. 
and where we are right now. Um, realism is still dominant, right? Um, and the kind of thread that goes uh, from Aristotle through the neoclassicists is still very, very strong. Um, but it's good that we're starting to not, <laughs> I say we, uh, the theater community on the whole is um, beginning to allow uh, uh, previously sidelined voices to emerge a little bit more and to tell stories about people, um, you know, where people like me aren't always the main character, right? And so I think that this is a good place to end up. Uh, and so thank you uh, very much for reading. Uh, I, the next thing I'm going to do is work on your final exam, uh, which will be roughly like the midterm. You know, different questions, obviously. Um, that's all I have for you. Uh, thank you.